Also, at uh, any time during today's conference, you can log on to my Expo credits to fill out the evaluation form and receive your continuing education credits. Other ways will be uh, NAPNAP will email you with uh, an attachment or a link to go ahead and fill it out that way. Or lastly, you can visit the registration floor. There is a laptop lounge for you to do it immediately following this uh, session. Um, today, without further ado, today's session is 103. It's thyroid disease and surgical management in the pediatric patient. I would like to introduce Marielle Morano. Marielle has worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City as an RN for seven years on the inpatient unit. Since 2011, she has worked as a certified family nurse practitioner in the Department of Ped Surgery at Memorial Sloan Cancer, uh, Kettering Cancer Center. Please give a warm welcome for Mariel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so as you know, my name is Marielle. I'm here to present thyroid disease and the surgical and the manage and the surgical management of the pediatric patient. So my disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. Okay, so learning objectives for today are to provide an overview of pediatric thyroid disorders and the medical management to discuss the surgical indications of pediatric thyroid surgery, to review thyroid surgical resection, and to discuss the post-operative management of the pediatric patient following the thyroid surgery. So we'll start with a little overview, the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a butterfly-shaped gland located in the front of the neck, just above the trachea. The gland produces and releases into circulation at least two potent hormones, thyroxine, T4, and triod triadothyronine, T3. These hormones influence almost everything in the body. It influences growth, brain function, including intelligence and memory, neural de development, dentition, bone development, amongst other things. Behind the thyroid gland, there are four small glands called the parathyroid glands. They're located on the back of the thyroid gland and they regulate the calcium in the body. And that we'll get into more detail when we get into the surgery and why that's important. Okay, so here's some imaging. This is a cross section. It shows the jawline here, and this is the trachea, and this is the thyroid gland around the trachea. This is an ultrasound of the thyroid. This is a normal thyroid. Here is the trachea, and then this tissue around the trachea is the thyroid gland. And it lights up. <laughs> Okay, so the thyroid functions via a negative feedback system. So what's, what the free thyroid hormones in your body and circulation report back to your brain and pretty much dictate and tell your brain what needs to be done. In instances when there's the T3 and T4 are low in your body, your brain kind of kicks in and says, whoa, it's too low. You know, we need to release more hormones. So they send out signals to the pituitary gland and say, send out more hormones, send out more hormones, and then the pituitary gland communicates to the thyroid gland and eventually more hormones should be secreted, and vice versa. If there's too much thyroid hormone in the circulation, the brain will say, whoa, 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 too much, slow down. It'll shut down the thyroid releasing hormones in the pituitary gland, and the thyroid gland shouldn't produce or uh, excrete any more thyroid hormone. And as stated before, the thyroid uh, hormones regulate a lot on the body, body uh, including maturation, differentiation, neurological function, growth, metabolism, the skeletal muscle, the cardiovascular system, and the reproductive, reproductive system. Okay, so thyroid function labs. At birth, there's all kinds of charts that you can look at for thyroid function labs, and each one's gonna give you different numbers, but these are the, the main numbers here. At birth, they're gonna be higher, and eventually they'll normalize over time. These are what we use as guidelines, CSH from 0.51 to 4.94, and a free T4 of 0.9 to 1.8. Like I said, each lab is different, each institution is different, but you can go by your institution guidelines, but this is what we use. Hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is a decrease in circulating thyroid hormone. It could be congenital where you're born with it, or it could be acquired or juvenile. Both of the forms can be characterized as central, meaning there's an issue in the brain or the pituitary and hypo hypothalamus or primary that there's an intrinsic defect in the thyroid gland itself. Signs of hypothyroidism. So some of the classic signs are hypotonia, macroglossia, myectedema, prolonged jaundice, umbilical hernia from this uh, muscular um, weakness, constipation, 
hoarse voice or cry, anemia, dry, thick, scaly skin, thick, coarse, brutal nails, delayed closure of the fontanelles, retarded dental eruption, growth retardation, diminished physical activity and mental function, and delayed bone age. So these are all characteristics of a decreased metabolism. Congenital hypothyroidism is when you're born with hypothyroidism. It's a big problem. So it's the most common uh, neonatal metabolic disorder. Most, the problem here is that most of the newborns that are born with this appear normal up to three to four months of age. However, if this goes untreated to that time, there could be severe uh, neurodevelopment impairment. So diagnosis should be made on a neonatal screen. So we should be screening all of our babies at birth um, for a thyroid function. Most cases of congenital hypothyroidism are from hypoplasia or aplasia of the thyroid gland, uh, meaning that it's not there, or a failure of the thyroid gland to migrate to its normal anatomical location. For example, the lingual, lingual thyroid or sublingual thy thyroid. Other causes are uh, maternal ingestion of medications such as uh, radioiodine, uh, prop propylthiouracil or PTU, methimazole, iodine deficiency, or idiopathic. We don't know why it happens. Okay, this is um, ultrasounds of thyroid. On this side here, you'll see this is a normal thyroid, right? Trachea, thyroid gland here. On this side, you'll see the enlarged thyroid. It's a little difficult to see, but the trachea is here. And see how um, hypertrophy the thyroid gland is? It's much larger than here. You could see by the width there. Then you have thyroid agenesis. So, this is just showing you more anatomical locations of the vessels in the trachea, and you don't see thyroid tissue. As well as here, I highlighted the trachea. You see no thyroid tissue around it. Down here, you'll see our normal thyroid gland with the thyroid tissue around the trachea here. So the thyroid gland is missing here. <laughs> There's my artery and my vein and the trachea. So ectopic thyroid is when the thyroid gland is not in the right place. It occur occurs more uh, frequently in females than males. It's uh, not, about 90% of them are lingual thyroid, meaning it's uh, to the back of the tongue. A lingual thyroid, only about 75% of that tissue is functioning. So a lot of times that won't be enough um, thyroid hormone or thyroid function to be sufficient. Okay, more imaging. Here we go again. This is kind of like, a, uh, this, is a, this is a CAT scan and this is just a reconstruction. So again, bowline here, and then you see the thyroid gland, it's right here. So right to the back of the jawline, that's like in the back of your throat by the back of your tongue. This is a nice picture here. You could see it here by the back of the tongue when it should be more lower down in the neck there. Okay, ectopic thyroid can be lingual, sublingual, it can be in the lateral of the neck and it can be intratracheal. And like we said, a lot of the times it, could, it leads to hypothyroidism because the gland really isn't functioning and it's in the wrong place. So we suppress the thyroid gland with using exogenous thyroid hormones with like levothyroxine, and that suppresses the TSH and causes a reduction in the size of the gland. So if you have a thyroid gland in your, in your trachea, if it gets too big and you get a goiter there, you're gonna be in big trouble. So we have to suppress that, we have to try to shrink that tissue as much as possible. And uh, supplementing with thyroid hormone will help with the reduction in size. Acquired juvenile hypothyroidism. Uh, most, most cases, particularly if a goiter is present, usually um, it results in, uh, it's from chronic lymphocytic or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. <coughs> Other causes uh, include a history of a thyroidectomy, radioiodine therapy, thyrotropin deficiency, thyrotropin releasing hormone deficiency due to a hypothalamic injury in the brain or disease, or again, we don't know, idiopathic. So how do you evaluate uh, laboratory findings? So we use TSH and free T4. Uh, TSH and T4 inversely related, so if your brain is saying there's not enough free T4 or thyroid hormone circulating, the brain is saying push it out, push it out, push it out. They excrete more and more uh, TSH to try to release more and more hormones. However, in hypothyroidism, your brain is working, it's telling you to push out more hormones, but there's not much coming out on the end, other end and your thyroid uh, hormones are low in the circulation. So we treat it with thyroid replacement, with levothyroxine. These are soft guidelines. Every, again, every institution has their own guidelines. Some institutions do two to three micrograms per kilo per day, or you can start with something like 25 micrograms or 50 micrograms daily. 
you monitor the TSH and their free T4 every four to six weeks, and you could increase by 12.5 micrograms increments until your TSH normal. So Hashimoto's are chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. It's an autoimmune process in which antibodies against the thyroid are produced, and it results in lymphocytic infiltrates within the gland. So your body is attacking your thyroid gland, and in response, it swells. You can have nodules from the um, lymphocytic uh, infiltrates within the gland itself. It's the most common pediatric endocrinopathy. It's the most common cause of goiter, and it peaks between ages 8 to 15 years old and occurs most commonly in females. Okay. Here we have a normal thyroid gland with normal vascularity. The blue and the red are like the vessels in, within the thyroid gland. So that's the vascularity of the thyroid gland. Here you'll see the vascularity in uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. This is just the right thyroid gland itself has a lot more vascularity versus this right thyroid gland, right? So it has an increase in vascularity. It's kind of subtle, but you can definitely see an increase in vascularity there. And that's what you'll see on ultrasound. You also will see, obviously, you might see a goiter, so you'll have a big thyroid gland, or you'll see nodules within the thyroid gland itself. So for Hashimoto's, the laboratory findings, TSH and the free T4 concentrations may be elevated, they may be decreased, they may even be normal. Um, but the way that we really diagnose this is with uh, drawing thyroid, thyroid, thyroid antibodies, which is antithyroglobulin and antithyroid peroxidase. And those will be present if you have Hashimoto's. Treatment, if, it's hypo, if you're hypothyroid, meaning that your levels in your blood of your th thyroid hormone are low, we treat you with levothyroxine. We'll also treat you if you have symptoms and your thyroid levels are kind of like on the lower end, we'll treat you with levothyroxine. If you're not hypothyroid and you just have Hashimoto's, you have a small goiter, then we'll just watch you with observation alone. It's not going to be harmful. Hyperthyroidism. So it's the opposite of hypothyroidism. It's excess circulating thyroid hormone. Most uh, cases are due to Graves' disease. Other causes are subacute thyroiditis, tumors which uh, produce TSH, autonomous hyperfunctioning nodules, McCune Albright syndrome, or acute iodine exposure are the most common causes. So typical features go along with um, hypermetabolic state. You'll have a goiter, you'll have nervousness, irritability, insomnia, exophthalmos, weight loss, palpitations, increased appetite, diarrhea, tremor, heat intolerance, increased perspiration, and smooth, mo moist, warm skin. So hypermetabolic state. Again, laboratory findings are the opposite of hypothyroidism. The TSH is going to be low and your free T is going to be, free T4 is going to be high. Your brain is saying there's too much thyroid horm hormone circulating, shut down, shut down, and the thyroid isn't really listening. It's kind of producing all this thyroid hormone and it's over secreting. Uh, the presence of TSH receptor autoantibodies and TSH binding immunoglobulin confirms the diagnosis of Graves' disease. We use radioactive iodine scan to evaluate for Graves' disease, and in Graves' disease it'll show uptake, increased uptake in the whole thyroid gland itself. Other things that radioactive iodine scans will show would be subacute and chronic thyroiditis, which would show a decrease in the uptake. Autonomous hyperfunctioning nodules, which would also uh, give you hyperthyroidism. We'll have increased uptake uh, in, in the nodule and the surrounding tissue will have a decreased uptake. Thyroid malignancies as well will have an increased uptake in the tumor and possibly the entire thyroid gland depending on the extent of the tumor. Again, Graves' disease is caused by antibodies, um, or, uh, antibodies directed at TSH receptors that stimulate thyroid um, hormone production. Mm. More ultrasound imaging. Down here you have normal thyroid, normal thyroid vascularity. And up top you have, here's a trachea, here's the thyroid gland, it's enlarged. And see, look at that vascularity, it's highly increased. That's indicative of, gra of Graves' disease or like a thyroid storm even. The treatment for Graves' disease is um, using antithyroid agents. It takes a few weeks to see a clinical response. So if you have a kid who's hyperthyroid, who has hypertension, tachycardia, all those serious side effects from the hyperthyroidism, you're going to have to treat that first because it's going to take a while for the thyroid hormones to actually kick in and fix the situation. So we have uh, the antithyroid agents we would use would be propothiouracil or PTO. We use 5 milligrams to 10 milligrams per kilo divided three times a day. We don't usually like to start with that drug because it 
it can cause liver toxicity. So the drug that we used to start with is methimazole. It's 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilo daily. And here we have the beta adrenergic blockers. That's going to be what you're going to use to treat the hypertension, the tachycardia, and the cardiac, um, the cardiac symptoms that the kids have so that it doesn't cause a problem until those antithyroid agents kick in. Radioactive iodine therapy is administered orally. It's reserved for children with Graves' disease that don't respond to treatment um, or they can't tolerate the treatment, they have adverse side effects, they're not taking it, they have poor medical adherence, the family's not giving it to them, the kid's spitting it out, whatever the case is. Then we would think about radioactive iodine therapy. Surgery is infrequently used, but it's an option. It's an option when the, there's a patient with a very large goiter that we're concerned about um, and the medication isn't working or radioactive iodine doesn't work. We want to fix that goiter before it causes a problem. Or sometimes when you have a goiter, um, you'll have suspicious nodules within that goiter. Sometimes if the patient is pregnant, they can't have radioactive iodine, so they would opt for a surgery instead. Or if the family refuses to do radioactive iodine, we, an option is to surgically remove the thyroid gland. Neonatal Graves' disease. So this may develop several days after birth. Sorry? Sure. I think, I think that before my time, <laughs> they did a lot more thyroidectomies. It seems like a quick kind of fix. The kids don't have to be on medications and things like that. So that might be why people do, were doing thyroidectomies, but now we have these medications. If they can tolerate them, I think that that's a better option rather than taking their thyroid out. Because even if they have a thyroid that's not fully functioning, they may, the thyroid still might be producing hormones and having some function versus taking it all out. And also the surgery can have risks, which we'll discuss further within our, the speak. Okay, so neonatal Graves' disease can develop several days after birth. Uh, results from a mother with Graves' disease. Antibodies cross the placenta, and these kids have Graves' disease from their mom. The typical findings in a little baby is premature birth, low birth weight, poor weight gain, goiter, irritability, tachycardia, cardiomegaly, heart failure, hepatomegaly, exophthalmos, increased GI motility, and fevers. Immediate management, again, should focus on the cardiac manifestations in these babies, so beta blockers. Temporary management with iodine or antithyroid agents and steroids are used. Our drug of choice would be the methimazole, 0.5 to 1 milligrams per kilo daily. The goal is to completely suppress that thyroid until those antibodies leave the system. And since we're completely suppressing that thyroid gland, we have to give thyroid hormone replacement with levothyroxine. We usually start around 25 micrograms and adjust to maintain normal thyroid levels. Uh, you treat for about six months until the maternal antibodies have cleared, and they usually will be cleared in about six months. The hyperthyroidism will gradually resolve as the antibodies start to clear the system. That usually takes about one to three months. So at that time, you could start titrating off of the methimazole and the levothyroxine. And once they're down to a short enough dose, you stop both the levothyroxine and the methimazole at the same time because they shouldn't need it anymore once those antibodies have been excreted from their system. Subacute thyroiditis is thought to be viral in nature. It presents with fevers, the thyroid line is really tender, and it's usually in the setting of URI. So the kid comes in, he's got fever, he's got a cough, cold, sore throat, and his thyroid gland hurts when you touch it. So it's a virus, so it has to kind of clear itself out. So we do mostly supportive care. We give NSAIDs to help with the pain and the fevers. We give low-dose corticosteroids if needed, and that's usually the only treatment. They kind of have to ride the virus out, and we just kind of control the pain and the swelling. Initially, when you have subacute thyroiditis, you'll have an uh, increase in thyroid release of the hormones, and then it's followed by transient hypothyroidism. In about 10% of these patients, they'll develop permanent hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism. Excuse me. Acute superative thyroiditis is kind of the opposite of subacute thyroiditis. It's bacterial in origin. The patient will present with hard nodules. They'll either feel it, their mom will feel it, the doctor will feel it, these hard nodules on the thyroid. The thyroid levels might be normal. And basically, they go to their physician, or their physician finds these thyroid nodules, and they have to work it up. So they do an ultrasound. They find these thyroid nodules. They need to know what, what, what it is and where it came from. So they put a little needle in the thyroid nodules with an FNA, which is a fine needle aspirin. 
once it comes back, it's an infection, it's bacterial, we can treat with antibiotics. And sometimes in these cases, there's a fistula within the thyroid gland itself. So in that case, it would need to be drained or excised to fix the problem. Thyroid nodules in general. So they're typically found, again, on physical exam by a physician, a parent, the patient, or it's incidentally noted on imaging. So the kid hurts his neck and gets a MRI of his neck, and whoops, they found a thyroid nodule. So the risk factors for thyroid nodules include a prior history of thyroid disease, exposure to radiation, and genetic disorders. Uh, ultrasound is useful in, in thyroid, as you can see through my whole speak, in, in identifying thy thyroid nodules and um, looking at the thyroid gland in general. It'll tell you the size of the nodules, it it'll determine if it's solid, cystic, the location of the nodule, it'll tell you if there's vascularity in those nodules. It'll, it can look at the, um, the lymph nodes around the thyroid gland to see if any of those are enlarged as well. And then that, based on those, that information, we can determine if it's suspicious for malignancy or something concerning, or more likely a benign lesion. If we think it's concerning, we would put a uh, needle again in, do a FNA, suck a couple of the cells out, so one small region, and that would determine uh, if it's benign or malignant. Pathology will determine if surgery is indicated or not. So if you have a small benign nodule, you might just want to watch it, make sure it doesn't get bigger in size. If you have a large one or if the FNA shows something concerning for malignancy, we would move forward. Thyroid cancer. So you have a thyroid nodule, you do an FNA, it comes back as thyroid cancer. So there's a couple different types. Differential thyroid cancer is one of the most common. It's defined by the presence of distinguishable elements of normal thyroid cells. So you have papillary, which is the most common type of these um, thyroid cancers. You have follicular and you have papillary with follicular elements. In children, adolescents, and young adulthood, 60 to 80 percent of these patients will present with regional nodal metastases, and 10 to 20 percent of those patients will have distant parenchymal metastases. So you have a kid with papillary thyroid cancer, the mother's going to freak out if he has metastases to the nose and to maybe the lungs. However, despite all that, the overall survival for this disease in children and adolescents is above 90 percent at 10 to 20 years. So that's reassuring. Treatment. So for treatment for uh, differentiated thyroid cancer, it would be a total thyroidectomy to reduce the, uh, reduce the risk of occurrence. If the lesion's less than two centimeters, some uh, surgeons may consider a thyroid lipectomy and isthmistectomy. The isthmus is, divides the right and the left uh, thyroid gland. We would do lymph node dissection to see if there's any metastases to lymph nodes. Postoperatively, we follow thyroid globulin levels. That's the tumor marker for this type of cancer. So after surgery, it should be either not existent or very low, and you follow that over time to determine if there's any differentiated thyroid cancer, if it's either growing back in the neck or if there's uh, metastases elsewhere. You can do a whole body radioiodine scan. That'll show, that'll show you if there's mets in the lungs, liver, wherever, you know, if there's any metastases. Radioactive iodine ablation is the treatment only for high-risk patients. Like we said, these patients can be cured. Over 95% of them do well. So we reserve this for patients who are progressing with disease or they're not responding the way that they should respond to this type of cancer. We can give them radioactive iodine ablation. So this is one of them. This is a papillary carcinoma. I have my pen backwards. Trachea, thyroid gland. I see this large thyroid nodule here. In papillary carcinoma, if you see these little, I can't I have a steady hand, little white kind of punctate, little pinpoint dots throughout that nodule there, those are called punctate calcifications. That's what you see in papillary carcinoma. So that would, based on this ultrasound, that's a concerning nodule, and we would do an FNA and move forward with that. RET and men mutations. Multiple endocrine neoplasia results from mutations of the RET proto-oncogene. So usually these kids have a parent or a family member with these mutations, or they have a strong family history of thyroid cancer. So those are the kids that we're going to test. There's three types, technically, of MEN syndromes. MEN1 is the three Ps. It's parathyroid, pituitary, and uh, pancreatic adenomas. There's no thyroid cancer in MEN1. So those, we're not worried about thyroid cancers. Genetic testing can be performed by one year of age, and, you know, they have their own guidelines for, uh, for monitoring. MEN2A puts you at risk for medullary thyroid cancer pheochromocytoma, parathyroid adenomas. And with this, we do a prophylactic thyroidectomy with cervical, central, and bilateral lymph node dissection. And it can be it can, we can do this starting at three years of age. So they're young. 
but medullary carcinoma can be problemsome, so we have to make sure we address that sooner than later. MEN 2B, medullary thyroid can get peers for medullary thyroid carcinoma, pheochromocytoma, mucosal neuromas, intestinal neuroma dysplasia, morphinoid habitus. Genetic testing is performed shortly after birth. This, the reason for this is, we'll talk about this in a, mi a minute, but it's more aggressive. MEN 2B can undergo a prophylactic thyroidectomy with cervical, central, and bilateral lymph node dissection starting as early as six months of age. So these are little babies. <laughs> So the, this type of cancer originates from the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland. Parafollicular cells secrete calcitonin, which works with the parathyroid glands to regulate calcium in the body. Calcitonin is the tumor marker for these types of cancers. Uh, medullary thyroid cancer can be sporadic. We don't know why it happens. You know, when the family has, they don't have any mutations, it just happens. Or with many MEN syndromes, it's documented that it's a problem. With MEN2A, almost all patients will eventually develop thyroid cancer, the medullary thyroid cancer. With MEN2B, patients will develop medullary thyroid cancer, and generally at an earlier age, and it'll be much more aggressive. So that's why you want to take those thyroids out at six months of age. Medullary thyroid cancer is very hard to treat. We don't really have good treatments for it, so we want to take those thyroids out before they start having a problem with them. Okay, so this is just a nodule. It's not the whole thyroid gland. This is a nodule. In medullary thyroid carcinoma, it'll be heterogeneous, so it has solid components, and this white in the middle is cystic components, and that's significant of a medullary carcinoma. Total thyroidectomy is the treatment with lymph node dissection to test the lymph nodes for spread. And since this cancer comes from para parafollicular cells, they're a part of the thyroid gland, but they don't actually produce thyroid hormones, so radioactive iodines um, radioactive iodine treatment is not going to be well absorbed by this cancer, so we can't use radioactive iodine on, on them, and we don't have good treatments otherwise. Again, why we have to take these thyroids out at early age. So indications for surgery. Like we discussed before, Graves' disease, if it's unresponsive to medical treatment, or um, that'll require total thyroidectomy. Thyroid nodules, if it's benign pathology and it's small, less than two centimeters, we can do a partial thyroidectomy, take out half of it. If it's determined to be malignant, um, then that will likely require a total thyroidectomy. In the RET, mutation, uh, RET mutations men syndrome, we spoke about this pheochromocytoma in M2A and 2B. Those are tumors that are unrelated to the thyroid, um, but they're usually in the abdomen, and they secrete catecholamines. So when you take these kids who have these men mutations to the OR, you want to make sure that they don't have a pheochromocytoma that we don't know about because they can be problematic with, like, again, have cardiac manifestations. They can have hypertension, tachycardia, and it can be a real problem in the OR. So we send serum metanephrines on those kids before we take them to the OR to rule out a pheochromocytoma. If their serum metanephrines are high, we'll usually have to deal with the pheochromocytoma before we move forward um, doing the prophylactic thyroidectomy. So the surgical resection it could be total or partial thyroidectomies. It's done with intraoperative neuromonitoring. What that is is when the surgeon goes in and opens the neck and is looking at the thyroid gland, he can visualize the lymph nodes, he can visualize the vessels, but the nerves are a little bit more difficult to identify. So the neurologist will come into the operating room and with like little tiny needles, they have this way of identifying where the nerves are and the surgeon then avoids those nerves. You have the nerve that goes to the vocal cords and things like that. Um, going around there. So we try to avoid that with intraoperative neuromonitoring, and that's been shown to really help with the side effects, like the hoarse voice if you kind of nick one of the vocal cords. So we don't have too much of a problem with that anymore. A transverse incision is made at the base of the neck. The thyroid gland is then dissected, either partial or total. The surrounding lymph nodes will be sampled if malignancy is, is suspected. And then the closure is dissolve the sutures onto the skin, and then on the neck you'll have either dermabond, which is a glue, or steri strips, which is kind of flake off on their own, so there's no real sutures that are really needed in the surgery. A penrosterine is, we place the penrose shade for 24 hours to decrease fluid accumulation and inflammation. So there's a lot of, you know, high real estate up here. You have your trachea, your airway, you have major blood vessels. So if you go to surgery and it's all closed up and you get, develop a fluid accumulation, that's an emergency. You have to go back to the OR. They have to open up the incision again and drain that fluid so it doesn't cause pressure on the airway of their surrounding vessels. So we've been, it's been shown that if you put a Penrose strain in for 24 hours, that'll drain that fluid and it'll decrease the risk of a collection there. So this is just an image of a thyroidectomy incision. It's at the base of the neck. 
putting this backwards, to the base of the neck. And we try to use like a crease in the, or a fold in the neck to just hide the incision. This is, this clear stuff around it is dermabond that'll flake off and the incision's right in the middle. Once the dermabond flakes off, the incision will usually just be a small, thin red line and eventually it'll fade out to be um, the color of your skin. So you could barely tell the patients that have thyroidectomies anymore. And as surgeons get, get better and better at technique, the incisions are getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> Okay, so post-operative management of these patients, risk of edema, it's the most important for us, right? So you're gonna elevate the head of the bed to 45 degrees to decrease the swelling of the neck. And again, that neck drain is gonna remain in, in place for 24 hours. You're gonna monitor for signs of hypothyroidism if you do a partial thyroidectomy. And if they have a total thyroidectomy, they're, they're obviously gonna start levothyroxine replacement. We do use pain management, we use IV pain medication and transition to oral medications, and they're usually discharged the next day home once they're tolerating their pain meds. So here's where the parathyroids come in. So the parathyroids sit right behind the thyroid gland itself. So when we take the thyroid gland itself out, if, whether it's total or partial, they're right near where we are. So we can tend to disrupt them. And if we have tumors that are involving them, stuck to them, going around them, sometimes some of them need to be removed. If we leave one parathyroid in place, that should be sufficient enough to control the potassium in the blood. But sometimes after surgery, if they've been disrupted, they're kind of like in shock and they shut down for a little while, <laughs> you'll have to monitor for hypocalcemia. If we don't remove all four parathyroids, usually they're, if the, the calcium levels are low postoperatively, we start them on calcium replacement. We follow their serum, uh, their serum calciums. And eventually they can be weaned off of the calcium over time as those parathyroids calm down. <laughs> so I have a couple of case studies. This first one is a five-year-old male with Graves' disease. Family history is non-contributory. At two years old, he developed a goiter. He had shakiness, nervousness, night sweats. After the goiter became larger, uh, he presented to his local pediatrician. His blood pressure, his systolic blood pressure at that time is in the 180s. So that's an emergency. He was sent to the local emergency room. He was presenting with thyroid storm, including fevers, agitation, tremors. He was tachycardic, hypertensive, and he had, and had a very large goiter. At that time, his TSH was almost undetectable, and his free T4 was 35.7, which is very high. He tested positive for the thyroglobulin antibodies and admitted to the hospital. He was started on methimazole and propanolol, the beta blocker, and discharged home once his symptoms were stabilized. Two weeks later, he came back to the hospital, and he had neutropenia and a rash related to the methimazole. That was DC'd, and he was started on uh, propothiouracil. And eventually, over time, he was weaned off the propothiouracil, I mean, the propanolol, when his blood pressure was normalized and his thyroid was more under control. He continued on that for a while until his large goiter had no response. I mean, it didn't change at all. So they said, okay, we need to do something about this large goiter. It's a problem. So in 2010, he underwent a radioactive iodine treatment. It helps a little bit, but not really. There wasn't a real, spo real response in the goiter itself. So from 2010 to 2012, he continued on the PTU. His dose was 50 milligrams uh, twice a day, morning and night, and 25 milligram, uh, milligrams in the afternoon. That initially, after the radioactive iodine, decreased the goiter a little bit, but it continued to be quite large. He continued tremors. He continued with poor appetite. He wasn't gaining weight. So it's clearly still a big problem for this child. It was referred to pediatric surgery. His TSH was 0.2, and his T4 was much better at 1.65. He underwent a total thyroidectomy, and after his thyroidectomy, he's been on levothyroxine and he's been doing well. His symptoms resolved, his goiter's obviously gone because we took it out, <laughs> and he's doing really well. So surgery was the fix for him. Case study number two, the 17-year-old female, she had a history of a neck mass for about a year. She's a teenager, she didn't tell anyone about it. She brought it to her pedi pediatrician's attention after it started to get really large. Her past medical history, she denied any radiation to exposure. She occasionally used tobacco and alcohol. Her family history consisted of mother with Graves' disease, a maternal aunt with Graves' disease, and a maternal aunt with hypothyroidism. So she has a history of thyroid disorders in the family, nothing cancerous, but still thyroid disorders. She was referred to endocrinology, and they ordered an ultrasound of the thyroid. Uh, there were two right-sided uh, thyroid nodules identified. One was 3.7 centimeters, and one was 1.4. So 3.7 is pretty large, especially if there's two in that area. Her thyroid functions were normal at that time. She was referred to pediatric surgery. We repeated the ultrasound. It was pretty much unchanged. 
Um, she had a 3.6 by 2.6 by 2.9 so centimeter solid hypervascular nodules. Hypervasculars, a big, uh, is very important. And a smaller 1.1.8 by 0.8 centimeter um, nodule, which is similar, again, with internal vascularity. There was also these weird lymph nodes in her neck. They were, we weren't sure if there was something or not. They were a little bit enlarged in the cervical level three, but they had hypervascularity in it. So we were really kind of concerned about her ultrasound. So here we go. There's that big thyroid nodule there. It's big compared to the other side. This is a little cross-section here. This is a normal thyroid. This is the nodule on her. So it's clearly it was large. Due to the size of the mass, excision was recommended. We went ahead and did an FNA to determine if it was malignant or benign, because that would determine whether we were going to take out the whole thyroid or partial. Pathology reported benign follicular cells and was negative for malignancy. So you underwent with the neck exploration, a right thyroid lobectomy, isthmus isthmusectomy, and with intraoperative neuromonitoring, in the operating room, there was no evidence of enlarged lymph nodes or any lymph nodes that were concerning, so we let them be, and the parathyroids all remained in place. Her, her post-operative course was uneventful, and she was discharged home on post-op day one. Calcium levels were normal. Well, to our surprise, the pathology reported well-differentiated and encapsulated papillary thyroid cancer that was larger than three centimeters in size, as you knew prior. And at that point, a complete excision was recommended. She had large, you know, an FNA only gets a small view of a huge thyroid nodule. So this can happen at times. The fact that it was very large, hypervascular, we decided the whole thyroid needs to come out. It's too big to just take out part of the thyroid. Also, we didn't biopsy any lymph nodes. Even though they look normal, there could be disease in the lymph nodes as well. So we took her back to the OR. She underwent the total of the left thyroidectomy. She had bilateral central compartment uh, lymph node biopsies with intraoperative neuromonitoring. Pyrothyroids again remained in peace. Postoperative course was uneventful. She was discharged home again on post-op day one. Calcium levels were normal. She was started on levothyroxine. And we wanted to suppress any growth of thyroid tissue in her neck or anywhere else. Pathology at that point, the left thyroid and the lymph nodes were all negative for disease, so that's great. Thyroid globulin level was very low, which is good. And we were going to monitor her thyroid globulin levels from there on out. She was 17, so we referred her to an old adult endocrinologist. So in adult, they have a little bit more guidelines as this is more uh, thyroid cancer is more common in adults. The cancer in general is more th uh, cancer in general is more common in adults than it is children. So in the adult world, she was uh, an overall risk for recurrence in stage one. Overall risk for recurrence was about two percent, so it was very low in her entire life. Radioactive iodine was considered, but um, in this case, it wouldn't treat her. It wouldn't decrease her a risk of recurrence because it was already so low but it would tell us with the scans if it was anywhere else in her body. The family chose not to receive the radioactive iodine and the plan is just to follow her th thyroglobulin levels and ultrasounds for the next every six months. She's been doing well. Thyroglobulin's level is normal. Her ultrasounds have been normal and she's doing fine. So we'll just continue to monitor her. The third case study is a five-year-old female with a ret mutation, MEN2A. Past medical history, she's been normal, developing well, no problems. Family history is her mother's 37 years old. She has a ret mutation. She had bilater bilateral medullary carcinoma of the thyroid at 31 years old, and she's status post a thyroidectomy, and she's alive and well. 31 years old for a thyroidectomy and an MEN is a little bit too old, right? Because we said at the age of three for MEN 2A is when we'd like to take them out. So she already had bilateral, bilateral medullary carcinoma at that age. So that's a little concerning. Maternal grandfather had a ret mutation. He had medullary carcinoma at 64 years old. Status both thyroidectomy, he's alive and well. And the maternal great-grandmother had a thyroid cancer. It was so far back they were unable to recall the specific type, type and she died of cancer at uh, 42 years old. So she was referred to pediatric surgery. Um, we recommended, in her case, the family was very resistant to undergo surgery, as you can tell from the mother going for surgery at such a late age. But we talked to them, we reviewed the risks with them. They agreed to undergo a total thyroidectomy for prophylaxis um, with a neck exploration and obviously intraoperative neuromonitoring. Her postoperative course was uneventful and she started on thyroid replacement afterwards. Her pathology, again, surprisingly, was positive for medullary thyroid microcarcinoma at two foci measuring 0.2 and 0.1 centimeters with diffuse and nodule C cell hyperplasia. That's indicative of medullary carcinoma. That's just the pathology wording of it. So at five years old, she already had evidence of medullary thyroid cancer, so I'm glad we convinced this family to take the thyroid gland out. 
Her lymph nodes were not involved, and her post-operative post calcitonin levels were undetectable. So she was referred to pediatric endocrinology. Due to undetectable calcitonin levels, there was no evidence of residual medullary carcinoma anywhere else in the body. She's going to follow up with, ultra, uh, with calcitonin levels, and she'll also follow up with ultrasounds as well. And she'll begin additional screening for pheochromocytoma uh, and hypoparathyroidism when she's 10 years old, based on the guidelines. So it's a good thing we proceeded with her surgery. These are my references. I want to give a thank you to the Department of Pediatric Surgery, my chief, Dr. LaQualia, uh, Dr. T Todd Heaton, our other surgeon, Anita Price, who provided us with all the imaging and radiology, and my two colleagues, Elizabeth DeSantis and Lauren Glenn. This is my contact information. Feel free to email me or call.